Okay, good morning everybody. It's 11 o'clock, so I think we'd better get started. So please take your seats. So my name's Tasman Crow. I'm a, a marine ecologist and I'm the director of the, of the Earth Institute at University College Dublin. Um, so my duty is just to chair the session this morning, so I won't say anything more than that. We've got three fantastic speakers lined up, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. We'll, we'll run each of the, of the three talks, and then we, we hopefully will have plenty of time left for questions and discussion uh, with the audience. And we'll, the, the Slido system will be, will be operating, so you can submit questions that way. Um, but we're also obviously going to uh, take questions from the floor in the old-fashioned face-to-face kind of way as well. So um, when, when the time comes, I'll, I'll collect some questions and pass them on onto the panel. Um, so, and there's also going to be an overarching question that's been, been set by the, by the conference organisers through the Slido platform, which is, do you think ecosystem service valuation is a useful tool? All right, so you get a chance to vote on that. There are various uh, options. It's a multiple choice kind of a, a setup. You don't get a free-flowing answer on that one. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's Dr. Daniel Norton, who is a member of the Socioeconomic Marine Research Unit of the Whitaker Institute um, at NUI Galway. Um, he was the lead author of a 2018 report from an EPA funded project called Vibes, valuing Ireland's blue ecosystem services. I think that's going to form a big part of, of, the, of the message he's going to present today. So thanks very much, Dan. Thanks very much, Tasman. Um, so, <laughs> this is a project that was funded by the EPA. Uh, it was undertaken by myself, Stephen Hines of Semeru, and John Byde at GMIT in the Marine and Freshwater Research Centre. And thanks very much for National Capital for inviting us here today. Um, so, I suppose looking at the drivers for this project uh, at a national, international, and from the EU perspective, the EU 2020 Biodiversity Strategy. And that will be brought in, in, many of the actions and objectives of that are brought in at a national level through the National Biodiversity Action Plan 2017 21 that was mentioned earlier on at the, the sessions this morning. So within, from an economics and ecosystem service point of view, there's two, uh, in target two aims for the maintenance and restoration of ecosystems and their services by 2020. And within that action five, each member state will map their ecosystems and services by 2014. This is known as MACE, and assess the economic value, which, where we come in from an economic point of view, of the services by 2020. Um, other directives and strategies, um, I'm not going to go through them all here because we're short of time and I want to get into what we're, the project is about, but the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which was in 2008 and it's gone through the first cycle and we're coming into the second cycle now, and that aims to protect and restore the marine environment by 2020, and within that there's a number of articles that deal with kind of uh, social and economic analysis and where there's cost-benefit analysis needed and where there's uh, derogations if the measures are deemed too costly. Um, and also our ocean wealth um, plan, which is harnessing our ocean wealth. Within that, there's an action 15, promote further research into the economic values of marine biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, within other legislation in Europe, you have I mentioned this morning the Habitats Directive, the Birds Directive, um, the Marine uh, Spatial Planning Directive, which is going through um, a consultation at the moment in Ireland. Um, we also have the EIA 2011 has been updated, so that once that comes into force in Ireland, there'll be more response uh, to, to report environmental change. And that's what we're looking at in economics. We're looking at changes uh, or flows. That's what Jane was talking about in her talk earlier on um, from a natural capital stock. So this is what we're talking about, ecosystem services. So I've included two definitions here. Um, I suppose I've always kind of had a fondness for the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment definition that the benefits humans derive from nature. Um, but more now, currently we're looking at the contributions that ecosystem services make to human well-being. Um, not so much in the marine, but just say in other areas like agriculture, that means that some of these contributions can be positive and negative. So, you know I mean, uh, it's, it's sometimes, especially in managed ecosystems like uh, agriculture or, or aquaculture or agriculture, you also have disservices. Um, so many of the uh, people that would be like ecologists, uh, like Jane, uh, that was talking this morning, will be coming at it from uh, the green, the ecosystems and biodiversity point of view, where they're studying the supply of ecosystem services, um, how nature generates these. And from an economic, economic point of view, we look at the human point of view. So we're coming at it from human well-being. And where humans interact with the ecosystem services, that's where ecosystem services are generated. 
So it only happens, so you could have a lovely river in the middle of nowhere, and from an economic point of view, that might have very little value compared to a river in the middle of a city, because where the humans are, that's where the economic value is. So that's so that sometimes people think oh, that's a lovely river. You know what I mean? In a rural area, and you know it has a lot of benefit. But actually, from an economic point of view, where the most people are, or where the most people are interacting, or have willingness to pay for that service, that's where the economic value is. So that's why there can be some issues in terms of uh, this economic framework that we use, and people should realise that. In this project, we use an economic framework called CISIS. It's the Common International Classification for Ecosystem Services. And basically, it's, it's like a kind of a breakdown or an accounting way of looking at the different elements of the ecosystem services. So in general, there's three main types of ecosystem services, uh, provisioning, regulating, and maintenance, and cultural ecosystem services. So just here for the provisioning one, at the section level, we can, measure, we can break it down into other ones. So I've just gone down through one kind of uh, pathway through it. So within that, there's nutrition, then we look at biomass, then we look at the, the classes, so wild animals, and for the marine, we're looking at hake or cod that are caught, so we can go down to species level. So that's how we break down the level of, and what this framework is kind of flexible, we can kind of go to whatever la layer that we have information at, because there's often a lot uh, of blank areas in the data, with a lot of data deficiency. So this is just some examples from our project of what we try to value. So just say in the provisioning service, we're looking at tangible things that you can kind of, if you think about it, you can pick up and hold. Uh, well, maybe not fish for too long, but um, in terms of nutrition, uh, capture fisheries and aquaculture, and then materials, we looked at seaweed and some genetic material. Then from the regulation point of view, these are things that happen in the background that you might think about. So I presume most people here went to the toilet this morning. You probably didn't think about where that went. It was just in the background. You know what I mean? But that's a value that nature eventually helps contribute to, you know what I mean, that you mightn't think about. Um, carbon flows, uh, habitat protection, pest and disease control, that Jane was talking about in her talk earlier on. And then we go on to the cultural values. So these are things that were kind of the physical and intellectual interactions are spiritual and symbolic and other interactions that we get from nature. That, um, that we don't actually consume nature as such or impact it, but we do get something from it. Not to say that there's not impacts from it, but these include things like the aesthetic view. So if you have a nice view of the sea from your house, there's a value to that. Maybe add it onto your house price, maybe not. Recreation, being able to walk along a beach, science, uh, heritage, you know what I mean? And then there's some religious aspects, uh, symbolic, you know what I mean, uh, existence and bequest values. For some, some people might never see a blue whale, but they might attach some value to preserving the animal for future generations. So that's an example of existence values, that you don't interact with it or you don't impact it, but you have a value for it. So looking at how we measure some of these. So um, we, for the capture fisheries, we're basically going on a STEF data. So this is available uh, at 0.5 degree to, by one degree longitude. It's based on logbook and VMS data. So that's basically the logbooks are submitted by the, the fishers and the VMS data tracks each boat every few hours. And we're only looking at the offshore fisheries here and the only ones VMS data. So we only have boats for over 15 meters. Now that's gone down in the meantime to, down to 12 meters. So we estimate that the fishers, it, this is in Irish waters in the EZ. It's about 470 tons. This is in 2015, I think. And it was worth then about 470 million. Um, in terms of the inshore, there's been some work done by the Marine Institute. They're talking about, I think, in the region of 14 to 15,000 tonnes, uh, and that's valued around 40 million euro for the inshore fleet. That's usually within closer to shore. So this is a map of where um, the, the most valuable fisheries are. So we can see there off the coast of Loud and off the coast uh, of the Salties or down off the Wexford coast, you can see two kind of bright uh, squares. So they would be the nephrops or langoustines or Dublin Bay prawns fisheries. They're quite valuable. Um, there's one off the Bay of Galway, but it's actually split between four boxes, so that's why it doesn't come up. And then you can kind of see the outline of the, uh, where the shelf comes in and uh, the, the starts to go down where you have upwelling, so you have fisheries there. So you can see the value all along the west coast of that. So this, this will be what's caught in Irish waters, but it's not just caught by Irish fishermen, this will be caught by French, Germans. It's an EU common fisheries policy. Um, then in terms of aquaculture, so you can see again, it's important from, uh, from a kind of, I suppose, a social point of view, an economic point of view for the West Coast. Um, so the three largest sectors are salmon, oysters and mussels. And the total estimated value is 100, about 150 uh, million and it's about 40,000 tonnes of production. So then they, I've 
in the report we've other ones as well but I'm just highlighting a few of the main things uh, today so uh, talking about wastewater then so I mentioned already that you might not think about it but it's treated at the various levels sometimes sometimes it's just let into the sea raw um, particularly in coastal areas to just kind of sometimes put a long pipe and just pump it out into the bay or just let it go by gravity and basically using data from the EPA uh, from both licensing files and their AERs their individual report we were able to estimate a discharge to them and using an avoidance cost so basically what would be the cost if we had to treat the water to drinking water standards um, we use that to estimate the value of the wastewater treatment that nature is providing us which is about 316 million so you can see there while most larger agglomerations have better treatment some of the smaller rural ones you can see are red sort of only primary treatment and looking at a cultural ecosystem service we can look at um, recreation so we did a survey in 2012 there have been previous surveys by the ERSI uh, that John Fitzgerald was talking about this morning he was still affiliated with them at that stage so during 2012 about 73 percent of people visit the coastline at least once um, but however less than 38% uh, of those visit the coastline more than 10 times. Most people are just going a few times a year and walking on the beach but there are a core group that are you know going nearly every day or you know every week. Um, so most of them go to the beach and, or the promenade in the beach, they're the main areas. Um, so looking at the changes we've seen, um, I don't know whether it was due to recession or in general anecdotally I've been told more people are interacting with the marine than before so going from 1996-2003-2012 most of them are the same except for um, basically other trips which require going to the beach with your kids or going for a walk so that's actually increasing a lot from about 40% of people up to 60% over 60% of people. Um, we used a, a, a methodology called meta-analysis uh, to measure the economic value of this um, the papers Heinz at all. Um, now compared to the other values which use market prices in this one we use we, we're including consumer surplus I'm not going to go into it here you can ask me about it afterwards but that would be larger than the market value here so the, uh, just to realize that so it's for some of these values you can't compare like with like so we don't add up all the values at the end because you can't do this in this project um, but we're estimating that the basically you're roughly um, <coughs> nearly 100 million trips to the beach every year in Ireland um, worth about 1.7 million to people. So they're not paying this, but they're getting that value from it. So where are we going next? So I'm involved in another project now. It's an EU interreg funded project called MOSES, the Maritime Ocean Sector and Ecosystem Sustainability. So we're using the work that we generated from the, from the uh, VIBES project in that, uh, looking at pathways to sustainability in the marine sectors. We'll be updating those recreational figures as part of that, because they haven't been updated since 2012. And part of the need is a need to move towards generating time series of changes in the marine ecosystem services so we can see the trends and also to look at valuations of changes to ecosystems for t in response to different scenarios. Um, particularly, I think climate change is a major one. So thanks to EPA for funding the project and you for your attention. And if you have any questions or ideas or comments afterwards, I'll be up on the stage afterwards. And there's a link if anybody's interested uh, to, for, to the report. So it's on either the NUIG SEMRU website or it's on the EPA website. So if you have any interest, that's where it is. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, so our, our next speaker is Professor Mel Austin from Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK. She's had a really long interest in, and, and a leading in, influence in this field. She was one of the, she was the author of the marine chapter in the UK's National Ecosystem Assessment in 2011. She served as Chief Scientific Advisor to the Marine Mar Management Organization and is currently the marine representative on the National Natural Capital Committee that reports directly to the Treasury in the UK. So she, uh, has been working in this area for quite some time now. So thanks very much, Mel. Well, thanks, Taz, and to the organising committee for inviting me here. It's uh, really nice to be back here in Dublin. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm adapting a sort of talk I gave recently about natural capital. Can it be operationalised for the marine environment? Um, and, and I was told at that meeting, you know, just put up the answer fairly quickly. Uh, so firstly, I've just got to also um, acknowledge that there are plenty of other people who've helped me with this presentation. Um, can it be operationalized? Yes, short answer. Um, in marine, we're accustomed to systems thinking rather than species-orientated approaches, which is, sort of fits with the natural capital approach. We've got a lot of data and modeling tools available. And in, in, in England, we've actually got quite a lot of legislation in place that would really benefit from natural capital approaches. But 
we need to give it a go to find out. Um, there, there's not enough people actually doing it, and it costs a bit of money to actually resource doing these kind of uh, natural capital assessments. And also, I think, for governments, they tend to be quite terrified of doing something and then having brickbats thrown at them for not getting it right first time round. Uh, but we have to accept that initially it's not going to be perfect. We've got to learn by doing. Uh, oh, that's what the next bit says. We will learn by doing. Um, so we need to apply it at large and small scales, and this includes things like the marine pioneer. So we have these pioneer sites. Uh, one I'm working on is in North Devon Biosphere Reserve, and we're actually trying out some of the approaches. Um, we're learning already that, that valuation, monetary valuation, isn't always necessary for the natural capital approach to support decisions. I think there's a just even thinking about the natural capital approach and thinking about decisions in terms of what does uh, the marine environment, what does its ecosystem provide for us that might be harmed um, uh, you know, if we impact or if we try this thing or how can we use a development to improve natural capital um, is, is a different way of supporting decisions. And as we do things, we actually can see where the key data and the tools gaps are and start to fill them. Uh, this one actually was particularly aimed at, at the UK. We, we, we tend to work better in collaboration. Um, and there's all sorts of things I could say about that right now. But in the UK specifically, I don't think government and research scientists work closely enough to try and actually advance this sort of stuff. And practice makes perfect, as with everything. So uh, Jane actually really covered all of this in her talk, um, which was just a quick recap of what natural capital is and what ecosystem services are and the language of natural capital, which has moved from the language of the ecosystem service approach. So it's our environmental assets and a few pretty pictures to give you an idea of what that means for marine, the processes and functions that occur with them, and these are all the stocks, uh, and they provide the flow of ecosystem services, as Dan said. And he covered these things, that there's provisioning, there's, there's food materials, regulating services, and cultural services. So we have this flow of natural capital, uh, the stocks, the flow of services, and the goods and the benefits. Um, the goods and the benefits tend to be requiring human impact, human input, financial, human, manufactured, social. And there is actually, a, I would argue, a strong ecological end point where we need ecological information on one side of that to work with the economic information on the other side. Why are these distinctions important? Because you're actually gonna do stocks and flows. You need to know the condition of the stocks, the extent, their health, uh, what the unit, and the units for these are different to the, the units and, and what you're measuring for the goods and benefits and some of the services, which is in valuation un units, largely in monetary units, but not always. Um, because there are other metrics for relative importance. It was interesting hearing some people this morning talking about votes in the public. Um, I would argue that's quite a strong metric for uh, ecosystem services and natural capital. Um, so we in, can create in natural capital accounts, we need both physical accounts of what the actual stocks are and economic accounts of what the flows are. And although I don't personally you know, feel comfortable using this language of accounting and, and uh, financial language, does help you to think about, you know, there's the money in the bank, which are the stocks, and there are the flows, which is how much interest can we take off before we damage the system, before we actually start eating into the capital. And probably at the moment, we're eating into the capital far too much. Um, as a scientist, what does this mean? It means things like nutrient cycling, primary production, supply of fish and shellfish larvae, or carbon burial. Those are the natural capital bits, the services, the flows of fish, birds, reefs and salt marshes, clean seawater, etc. Those are not the same as, if we think about fish, the landings are the goods. That's the goods that we take away. Those are the bits where we have to actually put in other human capital and get the value from them. But it gets more complicated than that when you're an ecologist. There's a whole bunch of different processes uh, that, it, that actually input into the different services, and they're all rather interactive in the marine environment particularly. I know they are terrestrial, but I think particularly so in the marine environment. If we want to make a decision, let's say we think that actually nature watching, whale watching is something that we want to improve, then we might think, well, if we do that, what other things are going to change? If we want to restore mammal diversity, that might be at the expense of food. So there are trade-offs involved. Uh, and, and some of the other services might improve. If we, if we improve the environment for recreation, for nature watching, we might improve it for recreation, for people's health. Uh, but, but there will be potentially disadvantages for food. 
Now, the problem with this, when you think of it from an ecolog ecologist's point of view, is that all of these things are in different units. Um, you know, they're measured in different units. Now, here comes the bit where if I talk to economists, which I do quite a lot, uh, I have a quite a large group of economists, but this is the even Ian Bateman version of this. How would you make decisions, not just for the environment, but also at the same time allocating scarce resources for health, for transport, for education, employment? Um, we need to make the changes commensurate. We need to put the environment on the same footing as all of those other things. We need to know their relative importance, i.e. their value. Um, and we need to have consistent values across decisions. Um, money is a convenient common unit okay, with comparability, comparability across sectors. Or, as he puts it, it's the least worst common unit, uh, which is pretty damning, but it's also kind of true. Um, so we have these economic values, but we also, when we're making decisions, have other values about the contentness with people have of those decisions. There are a whole bunch of other social values, um, and we're looking at the change in those values when we make decisions. So we might look at the costs and benefits, uh, but decisions are not just made on cost and benefit only. In the UK, the Natural Capital Committee actually has quite a direct line into quite a few different departments like DEFRA, which is the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, but also the Treasury, um, and transport, etc. So we can start to influence, if we actually put things in terms that they understand, we can start to influence policy decisions that are made. So in practice, how do we do that? It's quite a lot of work to actually work out what your stocks are and what the flows are. Um, we actually did a paper that biodiversity indicators can be quite good for, uh, biodiversity indicators for good environmental status as measured under MSFD, Marine Strategy Framework, do, um, directive uh, can be a source of information on ecosystem services maybe not a complete one but if we're already monitoring for good environmental status then we can also potentially monitor some of our natural capital stocks um, we've done quite a lot of work and we're, we're developing this and it has been it's been written up and uh, delivered to the marine pollution bulletin identifying what are the key things uh, the key links between natural capital assets and the ecosystem services and this gets you into the kind of conceptual thinking of, of models and, and how we actually put these things together. Uh, here comes a, a rather complicated diagram, but we can start to see what are the key components that deliver different ecosystem services. And the ecosystem services are, if this works, these things here. We just actually picked four ecosystem services and put them around the edge. We can start to identify the functions, the processes, the key organisms, key species, and the key, key steps and start to simplify the system, because the marine system is quite complicated. So this may look complicated, but it's a simplification of the system. Uh, we've also tried using natural capital assessment tools for the North Devon Marine Pioneer. I'm not going to go into any detail here, because I haven't got enough time, but we've created a natural capital asset register. We've created a risk register to identify the threats to that natural capital. Um, and we can start to identify where management actions need to be focused. Uh, we can do that in a GIS-based system, which you can't read here, but there is one. We've used a matrix approach to actually identify what are the key services and goods that are provided by the different habitats in that area and our confidence around those measurements. Um, but as I say, marine um, is accustomed to systems thinking. <clears throat> we don't tend to have species-orientated approaches. So this morning we saw a lot of pictures of individual species and, and a few of whales, dolphins, and a few birds, seabirds. Those are our charismatic species. We don't have that many of them, but what we do have is very complicated food webs that support uh, fish, um, invertebrates, sea life, um, and, and, we, and we're quite good at modelling those. So we need to make more, more use of those kinds of models. And that's what's supposed to be underpinning this, is some of the data that's in these kinds of diagrams comes from those models. Um, and then we can start to add in the, the sort of human dimensions, the valuations sort of come in at the edge around the periphery of this system. And it starts to look very complicated. You wouldn't go to a policymaker and say, here's the system, can you work it out? And then you can make your decisions based on this. They'd get a bit upset. Um, we can try and simplify things and pull things out. So we can say, here's, we've moved that around and said, here's some of the management measures on the left. And if you follow the little arrows, you can see what might change on the right. And you can start to visualize the trade-offs. Ultimately, we want to put this into a Bayesian belief model so that we can actually just literally press the buttons and things will change. So coming back to this, can it be operationalized? Yes. 
Uh, there are a few buts. We do need to have a go and find things out. We will learn by doing. Um, and I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mel. So uh, the, the third speaker is uh, Professor John Brannigan from the UCD School of English Drama and Film. He has also had a long-standing interest in, in the cultural value of the environment in general and, and more recently the marine environment. Um, over a number of years he's been collaborating with scientists, including me, uh, as well as um, artists, other humanities researchers and maritime historians to explore this area and he's recently led a, uh, an innovative project which combined scientists and, and humanities researchers directly in close cooperation to explore the cultural value of our coastline. So over to you, John. Thanks, Taz. So as you can see from, uh, from Daniel, what Daniel and Mel have said, uh, there's a close collaboration between uh, ecosystems work and um, economics which can address much of the, of the ecosystem services model, but how do we value cultural ecosystem services? And we were particularly concerned on this project, the cultural value of coastlines, with those aspects of cultural ecosystem services which are more difficult to measure from economic uh, perspectives, so aesthetics and scenic appreciation and things like that, which we'll come on to. So this is the project that myself and Taz co-directed and it involved uh, humanities and uh, marine, ecologies, uh, marine ecology researchers uh, working together as part of an interdisciplinary team based in UCD and funded by the Irish Research Council. So firstly, uh, what are cultural ecosystem services? Well, the, the best known definition is probably the, the MA report from 2005, which says that uh, they are the non-material benefits people obtain from ecosystems through spiritual enrichment cognitive development, reflection, recreation, and aesthetic experiences. And on the right, you'll see the, the more detailed breakdown from the, the latest uh, CICES um, classification of what those entail. So the sort of uh, physical and experiential interactions, intellectual and representative interactions, spiritual, symbolic, and other interactions, and then existence value and bequest value, ones that are very difficult to actually uh, assess. But why are they important? Well, first of all, they tend to inspire uh, deep attachment. Uh, I, when uh, Ella McSweeney was talking earlier, she used the words love and emotion. Uh, so uh, these cultural ecosystem services tend to inspire those kinds of feelings. Um, they tend to be unique to place uh, and in that sense irreplaceable uh, it, it, when they're embedded in place. And because they connect with people's sense of identity and belonging, they can also be very important points of entry to encourage greater care uh, of the environment. So well, in this we just see a sample of some of the, uh, the key uh, cultural ecosystem services associated with the coast, the art and literature inspired by the coast, the local seafood dishes, popular songs and culture, uh, water sports, recreational activities and so on. But what makes them difficult? Well, first of all, there's no common agreed framework for assessing cultural ecosystem services. Uh, they're often considered intangible, subjective, and difficult to count. Uh, there's a lack of data available on such services as aesthetic inspiration or scenic appreciation. And there's a lack of involvement from disciplines outside of the natural sciences and economics, uh, which we thought we might try and address uh, in this project. So this is why we developed uh, this model research framework uh, for the cultural value of coastlines. And we based them on the principles that you see on the left-hand side. So first of all, that we wanted to work as an interdisciplinary research team that was co-located, that did uh, field trips together, et cetera, uh, that would involve participatory research. So working closely with uh, communities, with participants in communities uh, as part of the research. That we would use mapping as an integrative tool, it's a kind of language that all of the disciplines involved in the project could understand and work with. Uh, and then because there's a, often a, a big difference in scale between science-based research and humanities-based research, we took a case study approach uh, which allowed us to resolve some of those uh, issues. And these are the four then steps of the research framework that I'll, I'll talk through in a little more detail here. So um, the first two phases aim to integrate the research team uh, to, get the, to get to know the area to be studied through walking, visiting, 
uh, meeting people in the area, and then building networks through interviews with key experts and expert focus groups. And these help to, per, uh, to prepare the participatory survey which we designed to connect with local groups and to test preliminary ideas and uh, scenarios with those uh, focus groups. Then we used a, a map-based uh, questionnaire. In Dublin Bay, we elicited about 230 full responses to the survey. It's a relatively low number, but it's a, it's a small project that we're using as a kind of pilot scheme to test this. And our survey uh, consisted of four parts. So personal details such as age, gender, and place of residence. Uh, then the values and activities that people associated uh, with the coast. Then the perceptions of environmental change. And then the fourth part was the perceptions of management issues. So who's responsible for caring for the environment? Who's responsible when something goes wrong in that environment and so on? And this map just shows the, the hotspots of locations that people identified as their favorite coastal locations uh, to visit uh, around Dublin Bay. Uh, Dunleary one, by the way. Um, now on this slide, you can see uh, some of the heat maps generated for particular activities and values which we're able to compare with certain activities. Um, so there's, um, over here we've got jogging, uh, bird watching, uh, there's water sports, and this is a Strava map that we use then for sort of comparison for some of the activities so that we could sort of validate what we were finding in our uh, survey as well. The survey also allowed uh, participants to upload uh, images, captions, etc., uh, from their own experience. And some of these images then are uh, down here on the right-hand side is what uh, people uploaded uh, to show what they cared about. So there's a kind of depth of qualitative data that we're getting from the, uh, from the survey uh, as well. I'll just give you a sample. This is just one participant's um, uh, what they've uploaded and the locations that they've uh, identified and so on. And I mean, one point of interest here is just, you know, with the image and the narrative that they provide, there's a kind of, um, you know, difference between the expression of, I love the sea, it inspires, it heals, it's medicine and music and a constant source of wonder, and then the image which they've provided, which notably shows uh, disservice. So you get that sort of depth of, of qualitative data uh, coming through. So then we also looked at the cultural representations of the coast, such as art and literature. So this was a conscious attempt on our part to use uh, humanity sources, if you like, for the methodologies to try and identify how we might evaluate them uh, using uh, humanity sources. Uh, we categorized each um, cultural representation. Uh, we recorded altogether about 160 cultural representations around the Dublin Bay uh, area, art and literature as, as primary sources, if you like. And we categorized them using the sort of CICES classification uh, to see how, you know, what came out uh, as, as the most important ones. You'll see here that uh, scenic appreciation comes out uh, on top as one of the key sort of cultural ecosystem benefits. Uh, the next one, which doesn't appear in the CICES classification, we would argue that it should, is sense of place, which is a major uh, benefit that people identified or you could see identified in the, the cultural representations that we uh, looked at. We're able to generate um, quantitative and qualitative information from cultural representations. The maps on the left here show the sort of density of, uh, in terms of locations that the cultural representations showed were, were key. This map here shows the sense of place and, and how significant that was in different uh, locations around the, the bay as well. We also used uh, story maps um, in order to, um, so that we could show how each location was represented um, and what themes, ideas, or feelings are associated with uh, different locations. And then we've got some nice uh, connections, so, such as this associated, uh, association of James Joyce's novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, in which the hero, Stephen Dedalus, experiences a moment of epiphany, of life-changing uh, moment of epiphany, uh, while uh, contemplating the seaweed uh, on Bull Island. So silently, the sea tangle was drifting below him, and a new wildlife was singing in his veins. So we have this kind of nice evidence that we feel can also be kind of used to engage uh, people as well in thinking about how their environment has been a source of inspiration. And finally, our conclusions, in which we find that the Cultural Ecosystem Ser Services Framework can accommodate interdisciplinary uh, research methods. 
with multiple modes of valuation. The participatory research has very strong benefits for community engagement and ownership. That mapping is a key integrative uh, tool at work throughout the project to do that. And that place is also a key concept around which cultural ecosystem services uh, research should uh, focus. And there are a number of sort of challenges and opportunities that we want to think about going on from this project or might provide fruit for further projects. One is it's very difficult to get the data on for the cultural representations, for example, to use it in this scenario. So we need to build the available data for all cultural ecosystem services categories. We also need to work on gaining wider acceptance of diverse modes of, of valuation, of non-monetary valuation in particular. And then we feel that there's a kind of engagement loop uh, that we can work on, that the results from the survey of, of uh, participants and also from cultural representations, we feel can actually be used to enhance how people care for their environment uh, as well. So those are opportunities we're looking to sort of develop uh, going forward from this. Thank you. the slide though. Yep. Brilliant. So um, what, I'd, what I'd propose to do, um, unfortunately the speakers can't see those messages, but I'll, I'll, I'll read out some as, as necessary. But uh, what I'd like to do is invite questions from, from the floor, and I'd like to take two or three questions and, uh, and then give each panel member an opportunity to, to respond to the, to the bits that are they're, they're most interested in have the most relevant uh, things to say. So would anyone like to pose a question or make a comment on the, on the back of those presentations? Please. Uh, Please, yeah. Uh, Uh, my question is, is for Mel. Um, you mentioned there ecosystem services and goods, and I was a wee bit confused uh, what the difference is, because to me, sometimes they're the same, or you can maybe put, put them all the way about or sometimes, but is there any distinct difference? That's really my question. That was a very direct question to Mel. I might uh, to sorry. answer that <laughs> before we move on. Um, the answer is no, I think, I think the distinction is, is a bit blurry. So it tends to be that people just talk about services and goods at the same time. Um, what I think is a more important distinction is between the services and the goods, which is what the system provides, and then the benefits, which are the bit that you value. Um, because the benefits are when human beings actually make a decision or think about what the value of something is. And you could have a stock of fish and it might grow or it might decrease, but it's not until you actually fish them that you get the benefits. So, yeah, that's the, that's, there is a distinction, which is quite important. Oh, okay, sorry, just let me follow on. Uh, sorry, uh, then you're valuing ecosystem services, but at what level do you cut off on natural, the natural capital um, debate? You know, you take the top 10, 12, 20, or whatever. No, how do you make that call? Ideally, you do all of them. Which could be several hundred. Um, yeah, and there are trade-offs between them, but unless you want to start... But you need to manage for the trade-offs. So, you know, we might be trading off the cultural value of people being able to go and take a walk along the beach with the economic value of using the energy and having renewable energy uh, wind farms offshore. And you need to sort of start... And that's the whole point of doing the natural capital approach, is to start thinking about all those trade-offs. The wind farm might also preclude people from fishing in that area. So that's another trade-off. So do you want energy to reduce climate change? Uh, do you want recreation that enhances people's health? Do you want to have the food from, from the system? You might also say, well, wind farm actually encourages wildlife and actually is, a, is an aggregating area for a lot of fisheries or fish. So there might be an overspill for fisheries, or it might be somewhere that you could put allow people to go and do recreational angling, in which case there's another benefit that comes. And you need to start thinking about all of these things. And the problem is that we tended to be quite siloized and just think about food versus uh, cultural versus whatever else. And we need to start thinking about it across the piece. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, 
Um, um, this is a question for John Brannigan. Um, uh, I'm, my name is John Quinn. I'm, I'm from uh, the zoology department at UCC. I was uh, very uh, interested in, in the approach of combining um, interests from across different disciplines. And at the moment, uh, I'm sure you're aware that High Island in County Galway is, is a place of considerable interest. It's up for sale. 1.25 million euros is the price tag. It's a phenomenally important place for seabird populations. Uh, but it's also interesting culturally. Um, the Rich, Richard Murphy, the poet, spent a lot of time there. You've got the beehive huts. So my question is a practical one, really. To, to what extent, in your experience, do you think different agencies within the government do actually communicate to try and bring together all of these different um, services, if, if you like, in your personal experience? Uh, it's a good question. I think one issue is obviously the fragmentation of roles between departments and whether there is good communication between them about the different values. So that's one issue, and I know that exercises a lot of people in the marine communities about how divided uh, up the, the responsibilities for marine environments are between departments. But secondly, then, there's a whole issue about um, how do you communicate value, right? And this idea that there's uh, a, a common value that we have to arrive at so that we can compare uh, different things. And what we're increasingly finding, I think, is that those values that are more difficult to express in monetary terms tend to get ignored uh, or excluded. They're, they're, in fact, just not counted in that debate then uh, at all because there isn't the kind of value that we can place. So I think we need to find ways to engage the people who care about uh, these issues most closely, get them involved in the process of, of valuing. I suppose this is the, I mean, it comes back to a sort of point about, um, you know, we're we talking about value as a noun or value as a verb. And if we think about it as a verb, we always have to think about, well, who is valuing uh, these and, and how are they valuing it? And that's what we were finding in the project is once you begin to engage through participatory modes of research, uh, how people value there's no end to what they'll tell you and how much they'll tell you. The difficulty then, I think, is how do you convert that into something that you can compare in a trade-off scenario uh, with other benefits? Uh, and I think that's the next phase in terms of working out a, an ecosystem services framework or indeed a natural capital framework that can actually accommodate these very different modes of valuation. And um, I I, it, it, no, it does. Uh, but I, I, maybe a follow-on question is: As academics, do you think we do enough to engage with uh, government to try and ensure that you do get cross-party uh, or consensus on where we should be spending our money? Uh, no, no. I don't think we do. I don't think we do enough, actually, as academics, to talk to other academics in other disciplines, <laughs> let alone talking to uh, the government. So, yeah, there, there's a big, big step that's got to be taken on, along the, that line. Thank you. Do either of the other panel members want to come in on, on anything like that? Um, sorry. I think, I think the big thing is, um, so when you talk about putting a price on anything or and talking about voting systems, or it's, it is coming down to how do we make decisions as a society. So then you go to, okay, we can go on a monetary framework or we can go on a voting framework or some other type of framework. So if you go on another, some other type of framework, you have, like, so you have to weigh different elements of it, like. So then you're bringing in weights. So then you have to say whose values matter. So I think that's interesting in thinking about, you know, okay, so just say that island. Just say, for example, if you wanted to put that island to a referendum, you know, they'd say not realistic, but they do it in the States and other places where the local communities might make a change to the environment. They say, we're going to increase your tax rate as much. We'll do a vote on it. Do you know what I mean? Like, so in case of that then each person has an equal vote then that's taking part in the process and that's how they decide, that's the decision process and everybody buys into it. So, but then the alternative is what else can we do with that money? You know what I mean? To do it for something else. And you know what I mean? So we're constantly doing trade-offs implicitly or explicitly. And I suppose that's, for my thing of doing this kind of sizes uh, or trying to make it more explicit and transparent how people are valuing this and at least it provokes debate you know, I don't agree with that value there, or, or you know what I mean, or, you know, this methodology, you know what I mean, like, but at least you're being op more open and honest, you mean, so that, that's my view on it, I suppose, to think about whose values matter. Okay. 
Hello there. Uh, Tom Doyle from University College Cork. And this question uh, follows on a bit from a colleague, uh, John, and from some of the comments that have already been said. But th the concept of nat natural capital, I think, is fantastic. But do we have a really good example from our, around the world where a practical example in the marine environment where we've applied that concept and you know, protected a species or a habitat based on the natural capital concept rather than based on some sort of, uh, you know, because I, I, I'm just thinking of Cork Harbour as an example because you might have fishing, one fishing activity that does basically one fisherman or two fishermen that are actually fishing that area, but then there's a lot of value in terms of the recreational fishing, fishing that happens in the harbour. There's a lot of value from just cultural value in the harbour, but they tend to get overlooked in terms of just the, the commercial value that you can, you can gain from the actual fishing. So I'm just wondering, are there examples from around the world where it's been demonstrated? Um, I don't think anybody would couch them as natural capital examples, but I'm going to give you a couple. One is litter and plastics at the moment. I don't think anybody's actually making decisions on what we do about litter and plastics on the basis of monetary value, but they are starting to weigh off uh, it's important for our environment. It's important for when we go down to the beach and we don't want to see plastic because it upsets our cultural values. It's important because we don't like the idea that fish are consuming plastic. And those are, are made on the basis of, of a wider set of issues than the usual sort of, you know, straightforward, it's this species that we want to protect or it's... Uh, there's, a, there's a difference in thinking that's going on there and the politicians have responded to that and it's not just on the basis of monetary valuation, it's on the basis of a, of a kind of, of information. The second one I would argue is possibly um, is, is whaling. Um, the fact is that you know, there is an economic value attached to whaling, but there's another value that has been expressed in terms of the wider conservation concerns, um, which, is, which is a different thing about you know, whaling as food versus, you know, and then the whaling as the cultural value to the communities with a sense of place who actually valued it, who've been overridden to a certain extent by, by the people saying actually it's a conservation issue and, a con and an emblem of conservation, we, we value this more than those other services that are provided. None of that's been couched as natural capital, but to a certain extent you could ask, argue that there's natural capital thinking has gone into those decisions. Yes. Very much, Karin Dubsky, Coast Watch and Trinity College. Um, I'm on an aquaculture advisory um, council, an international one, and ecosystem services are now something which industry is really embracing. And the more they embrace it, the more I'm getting slightly concerned. Because if you have an intertidal shore um, and you don't use it, sort of obviously, and you're now going to put intensive say, gigas aqu um, aquaculture, then gigas aquaculture will definitely win in terms of ecosystem services. How do you counter that? You know, it's they're filtering the water and they're giving nutrition and, all, and employment and so on. How could you counter that? Does anyone want to pick that up straight away or should we move have some other questions well, as well for, for Mullen? I suppose this is going back again, whose values matter. So that's a company coming in. And I think this is another issue, sorry, that we, like we talked, or Melanie talked about the complexity and mobility of marine ecosystem or marine ecosystems in general. But another thing that the difference between terrestrial and marine is property rights. So like who owns that area? I think that's an important issue, you know what I mean? Like, so there is a marine spatial planning process going through at the moment that people should engage with. But for most of the marine, and especially once you get outside the EZs, um, you know what I mean, or outside the territorial area, like, like ownership is a complex issue, you know what I mean, in terms of who owns the fish, who owns the rights to this area. I think that's very complicated. You know, that, that's in other, in the terrestrial ecosystems, we can say a is managing this, or a farmer is managing this, you know what I mean, so we have something there. And then, so the point of view is then, looking at the change, so here we have a change in an, eco, in, in an environment, and you're looking at what was the ecosystem services generated before, what's the ecosystem services generated now. And that's another issue in terms of data availability 
and in terms of educating people, in terms of educating the public. So if you're going, like, there's this biodiversity here before the system is functioning in such a way, and then people are going, well, I don't experience that. It's very hard, you know, for you to get that concept across. And then what's their willingness to pay to protect that environment compared to, here's a company saying, well, we're going to generate this many jobs, we're generating this, you know, thing, we're improving the water quality, you know what I mean? Like, so it's not an easy answer for you, but I think two of the big issues raised in that, like, is property rights and uh, uh, data deficiency for a lot of, say, what was there before compared to what that can be tangible in the kind of moving from, say, regulating cultural values towards a more provisioning value system. I, I, I don't have an answer for you directly, but I think if you start thinking about those concepts, you might get something from that. Well, I think, actually, following on from that, one of the first questions that was posed through Slido with Warren Fogarty was how do you put a price on, on the fish and marine life which are no longer there due to historical ecological damage. So you kind of alluded to the, the data shortages and, and how things are changing. Is, is, there, a, is there an answer to well, that? Well, when you look at the data for catches, so like the catches have gone down since the 1970s, 80s in the Northeast Atlantic. So like we have, as Melanie alluded earlier on, that stock of fish that was there, as up, the, the, they're not, the interest has been depleted and they were ever eaten into the capital as such and that. Do you know what I mean? Like there is some species that are coming back, but it's, it's hard to know still. I'd say it's I'm not sure a turning point yet, you know what I mean? Like, but there's a lot of work to do. And then, you know, there's a lot of division between, within the EU in terms of the common fishery policies and other members. And then once you get outside the EEZs of the, of the European Union, you have other countries that are fishing as well. Like, so there's a, again, that comes back to property rights, I think, an issue. Like, in terms of putting a price, I can come up with a really long-winded answer. I don't think it's going to, you know what I mean? Like, you can do modelling or something like that, you know what I mean? Like, but it's... That's a, that's a difficult process because of those issues of data deficiency as well. And Mel? Okay, I, I'd like to kind of tackle both of those questions, the first one and the second one, and relate them back to the lady there. Um, I mean, I think, yes, we can use modelling to hindcast and say a scenario of what would happen if we still had fish here? How would we get back to having fish here? What would be the management interventions? And then you can start adding in, you know, so we could restore the fish and how much more valuable would the system be after a management intervention? So we can actually do some of that valuation, and, it, and as, as somebody said earlier, I think it was you, it's not about putting a price on things, it's about putting a value on things. Um, economics does a terrible job of valuing anything of importance. Why do speakers feel natural capital can work in saving nature? Actually, I don't think natural capital can work in terms of saving nature. All natural capital can do is provide you with another form of decision-making or support to decision-making to say, this is what happens if... If you put aquaculture somewhere, you're going to lose something else. It's a trade-off. Actually, that's a trade-off that politicians, policymakers, management regulators need to make on a day-to-day -day basis. And all we can do as researchers, as academics, is inform them that there are cultural values that are going to be lost, that there are biodiversity species that might be lost, that some of those biodiversity species may have some sort of value to a section of society in that area that that sense of place may be lost and that has value to a certain group of people there. All we can do is place the implications there in front of the people who make decisions. And personally, I don't think that the natural capital approach is necessarily going to say or advocate, you know what, we need to protect everything. I don't think it, you know, it's, it's about making logical trade-off decisions rather than being an advocacy tool for conservationists. Sorry. And if I could just pick up on, again, taking a few of the questions at a time that, you know, conceptually, because we are thinking about ecosystem services and natural capital as concepts. And I suppose most of us are using these concepts, um, rather as, as Jane was talking about earlier, as kind of metaphors uh, for trying to understand how we are interdependent uh, w with nature and upon nature and so on. And of course, much of that gets forgotten, I think, when you're actually using these as then management tools. We forget that ecosystem services isn't addressing all of those things that are not yet measured or cannot yet be measured, natural, cap natural capital for similar reasons. I think when you're using words like services or nature's contribution to people or natural capital, we tend to forget that, you know, well, as living human beings, we are natural capital. We are part of that concept and we're not including all the ways in which we depend upon. Uh, and are part of uh, nature. Uh, so it's about, I don't think any of these concepts are deficient in themselves as concepts, 
but as they're practiced, they're not using the broad range of disciplines and methodologies which should be used in order to assess properly how people care about and value, in the broader sense, uh, their environments. Take one more question from the floor. I think there, was, there were two gentlemen. <clears throat> As was said, said by Dr. Austin there, natural capital is an important means of, I suppose, planning, good environmental planning, uh, and good environmental management in the future. I just wonder in this discussion if we should broaden the concept of natural capital slightly and take account as well of the abiotic uh, assets that are in the marine environment. For instance, off the east coast of Ireland, we stand the gravel deposits. They were deposited there by the ice sheets over 10,000 years ago. We have natural gas off the, off the west coast, etc. We have purely abiotic, they're purely abiotic uh, assets. Similarly, wind as well, you could say. Now, I know this is a biodiversity conference, but development of those could have impacts on ecosystems. So there's this benefits to them as well. So I wonder, are there any examples of what do you feel about in, in, in looking at the marine environment, also including those abiotic assets in putting a value on natural capital of them uh, as, as, as a means of proper development and proper planning in the future? Or are there any examples of that happening anywhere? You want to pick that one up first, I I can, I can, I mean, yeah, I mean, we do, it's one of the things with the, with the language of natural capital and ecosystem services, it evolves a lot, so there's a whole bunch of people who think that the abiotic services should be in there, and there's a whole bunch of people who absolutely think they shouldn't, um, you know, it's, it's an evolving kind of area. Uh, if you are going to include them, I mean, you can include them as, as, as something that needs to be protected or something that, you know, people value. Um, I think the marine example of energy is, is, is a really big one that is quite current in the UK, certainly at the moment, and probably here, of you know, how much do we use marine energy? What are the implications of using marine energy? Uh, I think, as with anything, we need to think about the implications of using, whether it's natural resources which are living or natural resources which aren't living. If we exploit and use them, what are the implications for all the other ecosystem services or the different trade-offs that are involved? Um, I think going back to, to, to what John said earlier, you know, the problem is that in a lot of these areas we don't have enough information uh, to be able to do valuations properly or to be able to think about all the different implications properly. So that's, that's always going to be, lack of information is always going to be problematic. I think any decision process you're going to either explicitly or implicitly, someone is doing a cost benefit analysis. Okay, so we're weighing up one trade off against another one. So like, Natural capital, there is a debate within the science literature including abiotic versus biotic, but really the idea of natural capital was to include these services that weren't being taught about before. So like gravel beds, um, in terms of either as, a, like, either as their ecosystem functioning or processes going on in them, or in terms of extracting them for whatever reason, uh, for gravel or the same with oil or gas, you know what I mean? Like, so any cost benefit analysis should include every aspect as much as possible. But the idea of natural capital was to, to put emphasis on this area that many felt was being ignored for such a long time. So like, just because something isn't included in natural capital doesn't mean it should be ignored. It should be included you know, either in the process or separately in your cost benefit analysis. But it's just that natural capital and a lot of process were being ignored for so long within a lot of cost benefit analysis. That's the idea of bringing them in now and putting emphasis on them a bit more. But it doesn't mean it should be the detriment of anything else like either. Like. Okay, we're, we're actually out of time, so um, I'd like to wrap it up there and thank our speakers and panelists very much indeed for a very informative and interesting session. And thank you for the questions and your engagement. <laughs>everyone to please visit the exhibitions which are downstairs in this building uh, we've got 15 minutes before the next session starts so if you have a chance to pop downstairs there's not many people going down there so please go down see the exhibitions uh, and make sure that you're you're ready for the beginning of the next session in 15 minutes time thank you